Okay, it's 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll go ahead and get started, and I'll call on Brian Fields to kick us off. Hi, I'm Brian Fields, co-chair of the Cosmo 21 Conference. Welcome to the presentation of the 22nd Annual Gruber Cosmology Prize, which we are delighted to host. The Gruber Foundation presents three annual $500,000 prizes in the fields of cosmology, genetics, and neuroscience. I now welcome Sarah Rea, the executive director, to say more. Sarah? Thank you, Dr. Fields. We are pleased to present this prize as part of the Cosmology 21 Conference. The Gruber International Prize Program, established in 2000, recognizes achievements and discoveries that produce fundamental shifts in human knowledge and culture. While we are here to honor Mark Kamienkowski, Uros Seljak, and Matias Zaldariaga, let me mention that they joined Stuart Orkin and Christine Pettit and Christopher Walsh on our 2021 roster. Please note that nominations to the 2022 Gruber Prizes are open until December 15th, and that we welcome and encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to cosmology, I must acknowledge our co-founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined vision and leadership established the International Prize Program, and whose care in doing so gave it the legs to stand on its own. The Cosmology Prize is presented in conjunction with the International Astronomical Union, a partnership that has guided our efforts since our earliest days. It's my pleasure to introduce their General Secretary, Teresa Lago. Uh, hello, I am Teresa Lago, uh, General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, the IEU is pleased to have collaborated on the Global Cosmology Prize since the prize inception in 2000. The IEU has an advisory role in the constitution of the Selection Advisory Board, and as a part of the collaboration, will receive an annual grant of $75,000 to be awarded to postdoctoral fellows from around the world, so they may pursue education and research at the Center of Excellence. The fellowship has been awarded to young scientists from many countries, from Algeria, China, Chile, Poland, Taiwan, India, Spain, Italy, Israel, Greece, Belgium, Netherlands, Russian Federation, Mexico, UK, Colombia, Egypt, Peru, Australia, and the United States. The two 2021 fellows are Rebecca Davis, Kayati Malen, and Liliana uh, Sandoval. And I'd like to make to share my screen just to present you these fantastic winners. So Rebecca Davis is a very short presentation. Rebecca Davis, she's, she's an Australian astronomer with a PhD from the Max Planck Institute and an Astrofidi postdoctoral fellow at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. She studies the chemical enrichment and the sources of the ionizing radiation of the epoch of reorganization with IFU spectroscopy. She plans to use her TGF grant for travel to conferences and to observing sites. Another winner of the Gruber Fellowship 2021 is Kayati Malan. He's an Indian astronomer, a PhD from the University of Strasbourg in France, postdoctoral fellow at Stockholm University in, in September 2021. He will become an enrolled postdoctoral fellow at Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg in Germany. He studies stellar streams and the dark matter hollow in the Milky Way using Gaia and other large data sets. He plans to use his TGF grant for a workstation and to attend conferences and support travel. The next winner is because we had three Gruber fellowships in 2021. The next winner is Liliana Sandoval, a Mexican astronomer, a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Texas uh, Tech, USA, and is now a Avaid Bafia postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta, Canada. She studies the transient phenomena, in particular 
ultra compact binaries with white dwarfs and the neutron stars. She plans to use a TGF grant to support Latin American astronomers for collaborative research and webinars and for travel and publications. As you see, this group of fellowship winners are very inspiring young astronomers. Thank you, Dr. Lago, for being here today. Our relationship with the IAU is invaluable, and we appreciate your participation in the event. Mark Kamienkowski, Uros Seliak, and Matias Zaldariaga were chosen for the 2021 prize by a Distinguished Selection Advisory Board nominated by the IAU and its affiliate organizations. The members of this board are James Evans, Wendy Friedman, Paul Ho, Robert Kennicutt, Alenja Angela Olinto, Jean-Luc Puget, Martin Rees, Hans Ringstrom, and Linda Tacconi. We sincerely appreciate the knowledge, commitment, and enthusiasm that the advisors bring to the judging process. Let me now invite the chair of this board, Rob Kennicutt, to present the official citation and introduce the scientific accomplishments of our recipients. Professor Kennicutt? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, the official citation reads, the Gruber Foundation is pleased to present the 2021 Cosmology Prize to Mark Kamienkowski, Jurosz Seliak, and Matthias Zaldaraga for their work on the cosmic microwave background, the most direct tracer of the primordial universe and of its physics. Their theoretical predictions and analysis tools for the cosmic background its intensity, and even more its polarization have been essential to the development of this field of research over the last 25 years, already testing predictions of the inflation model for the early expansion of our universe. Furthermore, their work has been key to initiating new observation projects extending over the next 15 years in the quest for detecting the imprint of primordial gravitational waves on microwave background. Um, this is the 22nd uh, Gruber Prize ceremony, and according to my reckoning, this is the seventh prize that recognizes work on the cosmic microwave background. Uh, I think that underscores the central role that the CMB has played in the development of cosmology, not just over the last uh, 20 years, really over the last half century. Um, another thing it underscores is uh, the importance of the interplay between observation, experiment, and theory in really enabling this enormous progress. Uh, four of the prizes have uh, gone for experiments, uh, the COBE, uh, uh, WMAP, and Planck space experiments uh, and their PIs. Uh, and then uh, on the ground for ground-based work, a prize uh, given in part to John Karlstrom and Lyman Page. On the theory side, the very first Gruber Prize uh, was awarded in part to Jim Peebles, who of course helped to found this subject, and then later uh, Dick Bond, and now of course our trio of uh, Mark, Yurosh, uh, and Matthias. Uh, one last remark, uh, I hope that by the time uh, you finished listening to the wonderful talk, which our laureates will be presenting in a few minutes, you'll realize we're not done yet. Um, the primordial fireball still uh, holds many other secrets and uh, they will provide the food for future discovery and I'm sure uh, future Gruber ceremonies. And uh, those are my remarks and at this point, I'd like to invite uh, our three recipients to uh, go on camera and join us. Now, normally, yes, these ceremonies are in person, and this is the time where they would be walking onto the stage and we all would be applauding them. So uh, Sarah and I in the virtual world will do it. I don't know if you have emojis enabled in your Zoom. You, you can join in, of course, as you like. And uh, Sarah, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kennicott. Um, let me just say that 
After our honoree lectures, prize advisor Jean-Luc Pouget and Licha Verde will moderate a discussion with them. You may submit questions via the Zoom Q&A function at any time during the lectures. And I will now uh, give the stage to our recipients. Thank you. So first of all, I have to say I'm deeply honored to receive this prize um, and to be included amongst the many prior and current recipients, um, some of whom have been heroes and inspirations to me and uh, all of whom are outstanding scientists. Um, just a really a wonderful um, award and recognition. So um, Matthias, Urosh and I are going to split our time this morning. I'm going to give an overview and background and then Matthias is going to talk about some of the work that was done in the 90s and since then, and Urosh is going to kind of close with uh, the current status and future outlook. So the title of this talk is Cosmology with B or Curl Modes from 1996 and into the future. This is a talk about cosmology and I know that we have a fairly diverse audience, um, including some uh, highly specialized um, people and, and others who do not know so much. So cosmology is the study of the origin and evolution of the universe. And the purpose of this prize is to recognize contributions to the progress in our understanding of the evolution and origin of the universe. Um, we've come a long way since ancient times. Um, where people had a much different notion of what the universe was consisted of and where it came from. Um, I think the biggest step, or one of the biggest steps in the history of cosmology is uh, Copernicus in the 1500s. And he was famous for noting that the earth that we live on is nothing special. And in fact, it's just one of a number of planets that circle around the, sol the sun, and the sun is at the center of the solar system. Um, there were a number of steps since then, but to make things a bit short, um, in the early 1900s, there was another Copernican revolution. It was realized that our sun is nothing special. It's only one of billions of stars like it in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a collection of about 10 billion stars that are sort of like the sun. They vary in their properties and sizes and brightnesses. Um, but there was then afterwards another Copernican revolution that followed fairly shortly thereafter in the 1920s. And that was the realization that our galaxy, the Milky Way, our collection of 10 billion stars is just one of many such galaxies in the universe. Um, in 1929, Hubble made a discovery that um, Isaac Asimov in his Chronicle of the History of Science and Technology identifies along with the discovery of DNA as one of the two landmark discoveries um, in science in the 20th century. And what Hubble discovered um, is that every galaxy in the universe is moving away from us and the velocity or the speed at which every galaxy moves away from us is proportional to the distance. If we take this observation and combine it with the Copernican principle, which says that we are nothing special, our galaxy is nothing special, that it follows that every galaxy, any observer in any galaxy will see every other galaxy moving away from it. And if so, what this implies is that the entire universe is expanding. And this was sort of a possibility that was envisioned um, by Einstein's general relativity um, that came just a few decades before. So our universe is expanding. It is not a static universe. It is dynamical. It is in motion. Um, here is sort of a cartoon picture of the history of the universe as we understand it now. So we are living in a universe that is approximately 14 billion years old. When we look out into the sky with powerful telescopes, we see galaxies like our own. And if we look further away, we see galaxies that are a bit different because if we look at earlier time, if we look at larger distances, we are seeing objects at earlier times because it takes some amount of time for the light from those objects to travel to us. So we see galaxies that are earlier. Um, we have reasons to believe that the first stars were formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang. Um, we believe that um, atoms were formed approximately 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, but there's a big question, which is what is it that put this entire expansion in motion? 
So if the universe is expanding today, that means at earlier times, it was higher density, more condensed. And um, it's officially early times, um, galaxy, sorry, um, atoms would have been um, dissociated into their constituents, electrons and protons. In earlier times, those protons would be um, dissociated into their constituent quarks. And, um, but at very early times, we really don't know much about what happened. So we have this picture now of the hot Big Bang. Um, there was a very dense initial state. A very dense initial state was very hot. Um, we know, in, uh, or it was postulated in 1949, or uh, theorized for the first time in 1948, that the helium that exists in the universe was formed in the process of Big Bang nucleosynthesis a few minutes to seconds after the Big Bang. Um, and this idea was then uh, found to be consistent with the observation of an abund the abundance of helium in the universe, which is roughly 25%. Um, it was also realized that this hot Big Bang um, should um, predict the existence of something that we now call a cosmic microwave background, a radio frequency afterglow left over from the Big Bang. So if you see, um, if there was a fire in a fireplace and you look at that, uh, sorry, if you look at a fireplace and you see hot coals, um, those hot coals are glowing because they're sort of the leftover from a fire that presumably was there earlier. So likewise, the Big Bang, the universe was formed in a very hot Big Bang, and the cosmic microwave background is sort of the um, glowing embers of that Big Bang. So this was predicted in first in the late 1940s, and then less than 20 years later, this cosmic microwave background was discovered semi-serendipitously by two radio astronomers who were working at the time for um, AT&T, um, Penzias and Wilson. And this is actually a picture of Penzias and Wilson in the radio telescope that they used to make this discovery. Um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovery um, 12 years later in 1978. Um, in 1980, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there was a very, very intriguing idea put forward for something called inflation, which was more or less um, an idea for what set the Big Bang in motion. So in the standard cosmology, cosmological model, the standard hot Big Bang model, we had a universe that was expanding with time and whose density was decreasing as the universe expanded. So if we live in a universe today that has some relatively small density, we can extrapolate this expanding universe back in time and infer that there would have been a singularity, a in point of infinite density, uh, which is what we generally refer to as the Big Bang. Um, but infinity is never the answer to any question in physics or in science. And so it is natural to wonder what is it that, um, you know, how is it that we understand this singularity or this infinity? And I, inflation was an idea that was postulated to um, solve a number of problems with cosmology in 19, the standard cosmological model in the early 1980s. There was something called the monopole problem. There was a smoothness problem. It turns out that the universe is remarkably smooth on large scales, and we didn't really understand why. That's related to something else called the horizon problem. There's this ugly singularity that I just mentioned. Um, and there's also a question of um, what were the seeds that gave rise to the formation of later times of things like galaxies and clusters of galaxies and solar systems, things like that. So inflation was an idea that more or less replaced the early expansion history of the universe, this singularity at the early, in the early expansion history of the universe with something smoother that extends back to much earlier times. So that idea of inflation was postulated in 1980 and is sort of intrigued theoretical physicists and astronomers and cosmologists um, ever since. In the early 1990s, we obtained our first map of the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. This is a map of the entire sky, and it shows you the temperature or intensity of this cosmic microwave background um, as a function of position on the sky. And what this COBE experiment um, found in the early 1990s is that there are small fluctuations. So here the blue spots are cold spots and the red spots are hot spots. 
where the temperature contrast is roughly one part in 100,000. So again, this discovery was recognized by the Nobel Prize a few years later. And then it was 1996, and um, I was an assistant professor at Columbia. Um, Urosh was a postdoc at the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, a recent PhD from MIT. And Matias Saldariaga was a graduate student at Harvard. And my collaborator, Arthur Kozowski, was also a postdoc at Harvard. And my other collaborator, Albert Stebbins, was a staff scientist, junior faculty member at Fermilab. And we were thinking about this cosmic microwave background. We were all um, dumbfounded by this remarkable map. And we're trying to figure out what we might be able to do in the future. We were in particular very excited by the prospect that we might be able to uh, fly at some point another experiment, another satellite, like the Cosmic Background Explorer, to make a map like this, but with much, much finer angular resolution. And so we started to write papers. Here's a paper uh, uh, that, um, that my collaborators and I wrote, and here's another similar paper that Matthias and Urosh Seliak and David Spurgel wrote. Um, and we started to wonder, um, what could you do if you had an experiment like Kobe, but with much better angular resolution? And we realized, and other people also realized, that you could um, learn quite a bit about the contents of the universe and the details of the initial conditions um, for the formations of, of large-scale structures like clusters and galaxies. And at about the same time, we were also starting to see measurements of smaller angular scale fluctuations. So there were experiments that mapped small regions of the sky and were able to image them which, with much finer angular resolution and show that there were actually fluctuations on those smaller angular scales. We also realized in 1996 that the cosmic microwave background should also be linearly polarized. Not only should there be temperature fluctuations, but there should be linear polarization um, as first noted by Martin Rees in the late 1960s. So instead of seeing just the color contrast, which represent temperature, we sort of imagined that with a sufficiently sensitive experiment, we should be able to see the linear polarization um, at each point on the sky. The problem that we encountered though, was that um, the mathematics to describe this polarization map had not yet been developed. The mathematics to describe the temperature maps had been developed a um, century and a half earlier, um, more, uh, closer to two centuries earlier by Fourier, um, who realized that anything can be represented as a bunch of waves. But how do we analyze polarization maps? Well, the idea that we came up with and the mathematics that we developed is to describe the polarization in terms of two different types of geometric components, an E or curl-free component and a B or a curl mode. And these are sort of cartoon pictures of what an E mode might look like and what a B mode look, might look like. And they're distinguished by the fact that an E mode looks the same in a mirror image. So if I look at this pattern in a mirror or this pattern in a mirror, it looks the same. But if I look at this pattern in a mirror, it looks different. It looks like this pattern. If I look at this pattern in the mirror, it looks like this pattern. So a B mode has an opposite parity to an E mode. And for my final slide, I'll just show you another picture. So these are actually the um, polarization generalizations of the Fourier modes. So here there are two different types of waves where the wave is propagating towards the right. And in the E mode, the polarization pattern changes along directions that are perpendicular and orthogonal to the direction of that particular Fourier mode. Whereas for B modes, the um, chain, the variation is along directions that are oriented 45 degrees with respect to the particular Fourier mode. So Matthias will now take over. Um, so first, again, I also want to um, thank uh, the Gruber Foundation for the prize and all my colleagues for the recognition, as well as uh, Urosh and uh, and uh, and Mark uh, say that it's a great honor to to, to share this prize uh, with you guys. Um, so what I want to do during um, my part of the talk is to uh, say a little bit about what can create uh, B modes, and then give a short summary of uh, some experimental results uh, before the the current time, uh, before the the current experiment. So what can create B modes? Uh, 
there's various sources uh, for them, vector and tensor modes from the early universe, uh, gravitational lensing, cosmic birefringence, and, and foreground emission from primarily our own galaxy. Um, so, um, uh, as, as Mark uh, said, uh, polarization is, um, is, is the result of scattering, scattering of an isotropic radiation. But E and E modes, E and B modes are basically a description of the pattern of uh, polarization. So um, anything that, uh, that uh, changes this pattern along the way, like a gravitational lensing, will change the E or B nature of, uh, of the pattern. And whether or not a certain uh, source of anisotropy creates, uh, creates E or B modes depends on what's the, their spatial structure. Um, so let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, so the, of course, at the time when we were writing this paper, the most interesting source for the B modes uh, that we had in mind were gravitational waves from the very early universe. So in this slide, uh, so as Mark explained, uh, E and B modes are a way to describe the pattern and they are um, scalars under rotation. So they're just numbers, one in each uh, point in, 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 in the map. And what di differentiates them is that, uh, as Mark said, the B modes change when you flip them in the mirror. Um, now, when we are discussing whether uh, density perturbations on gravitational waves can produce uh, E or B modes, it's easy to, it's best to consider just one single Fourier mode of the density perturbation or one single gravitational wave in the universe and see what it does because the pattern that all of them produce is just a linear superposition of those uh, patterns of the individual modes. Um, and in the case of uh, uh, density fluctuation, it has the symmetry of rotation around the K axis of, uh, of the K mode but also it's, uh, it has the symmetry, parity symmetry. So each individual Fourier mode cannot produce any B mode pattern because uh, the anisotropies it produces are symmetric under reflections. Even if the, uh, in the case of the case of gravitational waves is different. Um, so even though our universe might be parity invariant, might not uh, preferentiate one parity versus the other, uh, that in the case of gravitational waves happens just uh, on average. So if you look at the pattern of a single gravitational wave in the bottom left, you can see uh, the familiar pattern of the motion of uh, test masses as a gravitational wave travels uh, uh, along the Z axis. And you can see that there are two polarizations for the gravitational waves and each of the patterns that, uh, that each uh, polarization of the gravitational wave produces is not symmetric under um, reflections. And thus, each gravitational wave will create B modes. Uh, on average, the universe might be um, symmetric under parity, but each individual gravitational wave um, can produce B modes. And so when you add them all up, you can produce uh, B modes. So we, we, we now go to the next slide. Um, and uh, thus, um, this open a very interesting uh, window to the very early universe. We know that both gravitational waves and density perturbations survive from the can survive from the very early history of the universe. They are outside of the uh, horizon, so basically, uh, in a very robust way, one can uh, one can convince oneself that any gravitational wave or density perturbations producing the very early universe, for example, during this period of inflation will survive uh, throughout the cosmic history. And then when, uh, when we get to the time of uh, recombination or perhaps a little bit later during reionization when scatterings are happening and creating the polarization, if those gravitational waves are there, they will imprint a, pa a, a, a pattern in the, in, the, in the cosmic microwave background, uh, this B mode pattern. So uh, the search for B modes becomes a search for a fossil from the very, very early universe. And that was extremely exciting. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, it launched uh, you know, a, 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 a lot of experiments and also theoretical work to try to understand all that we can learn from, from, such, from such measurements. So we, let's go to the next slide. Um, as I was saying uh, before, um, the B modes are about the pattern of uh, polarization in, in the sky, not just about the source of the polarization. And uh, so, just uh, so if the pattern is modified uh, as uh, uh, as the photons travel to us, then 
the, the, the pattern might develop some B mode, a little bit of a B mode, even if it didn't have it at the very beginning. And uh, the first example, and perhaps the, the uh, currently most interesting example of, of such um, effect is that of gravitational lensing. So if you imagine that on the, uh, on the uh, last scattering surface, you have a perfect E mode, then lensing deflects the trajectory of the photons and then uh, you will see these uh, rods of the polarization pattern at different locations on the sky. And so when you decompose this into E and B modes, it will have a little bit of B modes because the, the, the symmetry of the pattern will be slightly broken. And so we know that gravitational lensing then not only changes a little bit the power spectrum of the E modes and temperature fluctuations that we see on the sky, but it will also generate some B modes even if they were not there uh, to start with. And thus it becomes a guaranteed signal for, B, for these B mode search experiments. So let's go on to the next slide. So as a result, uh, when we are in our search for uh, B modes from, uh, from, uh, um, from gravitational uh, waves, uh, we will also be able to learn about the, the, how photons are deflected uh, along, as they travel along the line of sight. This tells us about the distribution of dark matter. This also tells us about um, the expansion history of the universe in, in, in a period of time when, it, when its uh, uh, expansion was dominated by the dark energy. So lensing is in itself a very interesting uh, signal, but it also acts as a foreground for, for our um, our search for, for the primordial B modes from gravitational lensing. Um, and this slide just shows us some relative uh, amplitude of these different components. Um, um, and of course, the, the, the amplitude of the, of the contribution from gravitational waves that has two peaks, one at recombination and one at reionization is not known and it depends on what's the amplitude of these gravitational waves producing the very early universe. So next slide. Um, there are other effects that uh, that might um, might uh, change the direction of uh, or the pattern of polarization on the sky, if, for example, and uh, if, for example, there is a light scalar field coupled in a in a particular way to the photons, it might rotate uh, its angle of polarization. This is called birefringence or cosmic birefringence. Um, and you know, there's a this uh, this realization. Uh, has a long history. We've been also accustomed to talking about scalar fields and so on a lot since the discovery of the dark energy. Um, and uh, so many people have worked on this, including, for example, Sean Carroll. But I wanted to also uh, mention here, I, I put it uh, um, Diego Harari, who was my undergraduate uh, advisor, and uh, he did this work on uh, cosmic wave refringe in one of the first papers. and. Uh, when he was a postdoc in the US. And when he came back to Argentina, he was my undergraduate advisor and he steered me towards uh, cosmology and the cosmic microwave background. So it's, uh, it's also great to see that this topic of cosmic microfringence is now also back in, uh, in, the, in the spotlight. Uh, maybe we'll hear a little bit more later. So next slide. Um, and of course, uh, the elephant in the room uh, is that uh, foreground emission from uh, our own galaxy in particular, or these days in particular, we focus on, on uh, galactic dust. Also, uh, that, that pattern of polarization produced by foregrounds also has both E and B modes. Of course, the frequency, its frequency dependence uh, is different than the one of the cosmic microwave background. It's also its spatial dependence is uh, different from the cosmic microwave background. And everybody is uh, trying to use this, uh, these uh, differences to try to uh, uh, tell it apart and separate it. Uh, but, of, but the size of this effect is, is large compared to the signals that we are, we are interested in. So next slide. Um, so as a result of these, uh, you know, nice science targets of uh, a, a probe of the very early universe, a probe of the more uh, recent universe, the, the location of dark matter and so on, there's a, a lot of experiments in the, that uh, have gone after polarization and, uh, and, um, and um, you know, made incredible progress in the years after our paper on, on the E and B modes and or uh, curl and, and gradient modes, I should say. Um, 
And uh, I mean, I will not be able, of course, to make justice to all of these experimental results. So I'll just show you a few examples. But uh, for me, it, it gives me a place to, 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 to say how, how lucky I think I am to have been in the field at this time, where we went from you know, some idea of these EMB modes, which definitely were you know, some futuristic crazy thing for the future, who knows, and it was completely out there at the time to something that is happening, it, you know, it took 20 years, but in the meantime, there were, or, or 20 something years, but in the meantime, uh, there were all of these progress that, you know, kept us interested and in finding new and new things and making the uh, you know, um, co consistent improvements all the time, which was just great. And, and, and I, I really cannot uh, understand, you know, overstate how, how, how lucky the, I, I was in being involved in all of this. So. Uh, next slide, um, ju just uh, just to show uh, a few examples. So we went in the year uh, in the early 2000s for, to the discovery of the CMB polarization, and now that we are accustomed to seeing power spectrum of the current of, of, of the current uh, um, um, of the current uh, experiments, uh, you know, the, the the beginning we were just uh, people were just trying to fit some. Uh, some amplitude for the for the um, for the power spectrum of T and E, and so in the early 2000s, uh, Desi discovered uh, measured for the first time that the anisotropies of the CMB were polarized. So next slide, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit, but not so not not so much uh, different uh, difference in time, but. We, the satellites pro first with WMAP provided us with a beautiful TE uh, cross correlation between temperature and polarization measurements. And eventually we came to Planck where we have beautiful uh, temperature, E modes uh, and uh, uh, spectra. So next, uh, next slide. And then also eventually we, we got to, uh, to measure measuring B modes uh, from lensing. Uh, both uh, in these slides show some examples uh, from uh, from the South Pole Telescope that uh, measured uh, the effect of gravitational lensing through uh, cross correlations with the tracers of large scale structure. And the next slide is an example of the first measurements of just B modes in the uh, uh, auto auto spectra. So there's been been great progress. Uh, in, in the field since we wrote uh, the paper. Every couple of years, there's just, uh, in the, we get to the new stage. And so it's just been uh, wonderful. And I have to thank uh, you know, all the people, experimentalists, colleagues, et cetera, for, for all the hard work, which has made this uh, such fun uh, thing to watch for me. And now I think we are, uh, it's time for Urosh. Oh, no, 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 I, I, I sorry, okay. I, I should say that the, the next, uh, then, sorry, the next step, uh, uh, the measurement of uh, of uh, the the gravitational lensing has made great advances, including uh, from Planck just now detailed maps of the distribution of dark matter uh, and measurements of the power spectrum. And the next slide. Let's see if now it's worse. Oh, it, it, there there was another one. Sorry. Um, so of course, uh, as I said, foregrounds can. Uh, can produce B modes uh, in the polarization, and we are all very well aware of this by now. And uh, so they are producing uh, B modes at the level that we are interested for the searches of uh, for gravitational waves. And uh, we are hoping that both by using their spatial dependence and the frequency dependence of foregrounds, we can tell these things apart. And and now I think yes, it's the time for rush. Okay, so uh, let me also thank you, the Gruber Foundation, the committee uh, for this wonderful recognition. And I also wanna thank all the giants that uh, did a lot of the legwork before us. We really are standing on the shoulders of the giants of this field. So uh, what I wanna uh, spend on the next 50 minutes is I wanna talk about what can we, uh, what we have already learned uh, from CMB polarization and uh, what's still to come. Uh, before I, talk about uh, B mode polarization, let me uh, quickly mention that uh, E polarization uh, modes are also very important. Uh, in particular, they are the cleanest way to measure um, the dark ages of our universe in the sense of um, measuring the realization uh, optical depth, as we say. So basically, the idea is that the universe, when the first stars light up, 
the universe uh, gets reionized again, um, and the photons are again scattering off the electrons because electrons are now free. Um, and this creates an effect that uh, shows up best actually in, in, the, in, the, in the E mode. Um, I'm showing on the right um, a couple of these reionization histories uh, where I'm talking, uh, showing reionization um, fraction, which is one at low redshifts. We think universe is fully reionized low, low redshifts, but then we don't really know when this kicked, kicked uh, in. Um, this depends somewhat on the type of um, uh, the stars that were first reionizing universe. POP2 would be population two, the typical stars like, like our own uh, sun. And then population three are uh, maybe some uh, more exotic uh, initial stars that maybe have reionized the universe uh, earlier. And you can see that these different uh, reionization histories then also lead to different E-type polarization in the bottom uh, right, um, which we can measure. Um, in fact, I'm showing, uh, we're showing the results from Planck, uh, both Planck 2015 and 2018. What we see is that Planck measures these things quite well, but we also see differences uh, in the two Planck uh, measurements. Um, this is just showing that the systematics are difficult to measure and that there have been significant improvements in the Planck analysis uh, from 15 to 18. And we still don't know if the 2018 is the last uh, word on the subject. In fact, we think that with the future uh, CMB polarization uh, measurements, we can do even somewhat better. We still haven't reached the full cosmic variance limit here, and so there's still more, more to be learned uh, in the future. Next slide. Okay, so now switching gears uh, back to the B modes, uh, what can we learn about B modes? We can learn about inflation, as we heard already uh, from uh, Mark and Matthias. Um, basically, um, what is inflation? It's uh, a nearly homogeneous scalar field called inflaton whose potential uh, is flat somewhere. Um, and that during, uh, when this pot uh, potential is flat, the potential energy dominates uh, the kinetic energy and we get a nearly exponential expansion of the universe. Uh, the simplest models inflation therefore predict nearly scale invariant power law power spectrum. In other words, um, there should be no scale uh, and the slope of this, uh, uh, of this power spectrum should be close to one in, uh, in some specific, specific units. Um, then it predicts that the density fluctuations and the gravity waves, and but the gravity waves are subdominant. Uh, it predicts that the, the fluctuations are nearly Gaussian, uh, the fluctuations are adiabatic, and that uh, the universe is spatially flat. Uh, and there are several open questions still about this inflation. It's not a, it's not a single uh, single model. There are many different uh, flavors of inflation. Uh, the questions are: What is the energy scale of inflation? Uh, what is the inflaton field and how far it has traveled? Was that critical scale of the inflaton field? Uh, how did inflation begin? And things like that. Next slide. All right, so here I'm showing um, the current um, and future uh, constraints on these single field uh, models of inflation. Let's just focus on the right uh, panel, um, so the, the figure. Um, first of all, there are the current results, which are um, okay, so first of all, what are we showing? We're showing the slope and S on the X axis and on the Y axis, it's, it's the tensor to scalar ratio or R we call it. And as I said, that's a subdominant, uh, gravity waves are subdominant or tensors are subdominant. So this R it has to be less than one. Um, now the current constraints are in this light blue and they're a combination of uh, bicep and Planck. And you can see that the current uh, upper limit on R is about 0 0.06 and that the NS slope is uh, roughly 0.965. All right, these constraints are already quite uh, um, constraining in the sense that the pure power law um, uh, potentials, this phi to the p power, where p can be anything, this is this, this dark blue, um, this uh, model is essentially already ruled out by current constraints. So we already know kind of that we, uh, inflation, inflaton cannot be, the inflaton potential cannot be a pure power law. And so the ha it has to have a sub characteristic scale, a feature in the potential. So that's shown on the bottom left. Um, this V over B0 you know, shows kind of a feature. And there's a critical scale in the units of Planck scale. And now the question is, um, what is the, this typical scale? Um, uh, again, going back to the, to the top right uh, figure, there are four lines, four dash lines there, where we vary this scale from sub-Planckian scale, which is four Planck, to uh, down to, uh, you know, to two, to one, and half. And you can see how R keeps going down. Um, now, if we believe that the slope is NS is 0.965, uh, then you can see uh, also what the, the future um, 
actually the ongoing and the future experiments are going to be able to measure in terms of R. The, this generation three experiments, stage three experiments, um, such as uh, South Pole Telescope and Simons Observatory, are going to be measuring uh, a factor of a few uh, better than BICEP and also the future BICEP um, uh, versions. Uh, and then um, the, the constraints which might be achievable in the next decade through new generation of experiments, uh, such as stage four experiments, CMB stage four uh, and Lightbird, you can see they will go down to R of 10 to minus three and maybe even further below. And what we can see is therefore, next slide, uh, we can see that uh, this target, this 10 to minus three is a good target because it's telling us that if we reach this uh, R of 10 to minus three, then we will be excluding uh, all the models that predict this uh, NS of, to be around 0 0.965 and are super Planck in the sense that this theoretical scale is, is uh, you know, M Planck or larger. So, um, but one thing that we already heard before and these two uh, bottom panels are, are um, emphasizing again is in order to achieve this, we have to remove this uh, lensing effect. Uh, for example, the bottom left panel, um, the top panel shows a sigma, so how, how well we can measure this R. Um, and uh, the top uh, line is we, if we don't do delensing, uh, no delensing, uh, you can see basically we can measure it only with an error of about three or four times 10 to the minus three. So we will not be able to reach uh, this limit of 10 to the minus three if, um, unless we delens the signal. And uh, how do we delens the signal? Well, by measuring this lensing signal and trying to remove it. And in order to do this, we actually have to measure CMB polarization, uh, both B and E modes, uh, with very small noise level. And that's what the bottom panel is showing. Um, it's a function of number of detector years. Uh, and you can see in, you know, at the, at the, when, if we have uh, like a million of these detector years, then we can delens uh, at the level at roughly 10 minus three. Those are, these are predictions for CMBS4. Um, in, on the right panel, we show how this is as a function of sky coverage. It turns out actually we do not have to measure the whole sky. In fact, only a few percent of the sky is enough to actually this, uh, reach this limit of 10 minus three. Next slide. Okay, so I've been saying that uh, we have to delens, and so this gives an impression that this lensing is just a nuisance uh, effect that we uh, want to get rid of and forget about it. But somebody's dust is someone else's gold, as the saying goes. And uh, here I'm showing again this uh, this uh, contribution from the gravity waves, which uh, let's maybe just take the green line, uh, 10 minus three you can see that uh, it's almost always below lensing, which is why we have to de-lens in order to get to the minus three. But you can also see that at high L, this is completely swamped by the lensing effect. So in other words, at high L, high multiple moment L, uh, the effect is uh, completely dominated by just lensing. So um, what can we do with this? Uh, it turns out that we can learn this lensing effect very well, simply by saying, um, well, we have we are measuring B modes. They are from lensing. We, you know, at high L, we don't think primordial gravity waves are relevant at all. So we are measuring something B modes. We are also measuring these E modes, and we know that B modes are created from the E modes and the lensing effect. And so it, one can just write down literally some kind of linear equations, linear system equations, and solve for the lensing effect. So it turns out actually, you know, in the absence of noise, this is actually. Uh, relatively uh, straightforward and simple, and we can measure this lensing effect extremely well. Uh, of course, noise complicates things, but um, as I have seen, shown on previous slides, we want to have low noise anyways for the delensing. Next slide. Okay, so um, what is this telling us? First of all, um, the lensing effect that we measure just from, let's say, CMB polarization is telling us the projected dark matter distribution along the line of sight from a redshift zero to the redshift of last cutting surface at uh, roughly a redshift of 1,000. So that's already interesting on its own. However, it gets even more interesting if we now try to cross correlate this signal with galaxies. And the reason this is interesting um, is that for galaxies, uh, we can use galaxy colors to get their approximate redshifts. And so now if we cross correlate um, uh, this signal, lensing signal with galaxies, we learn about how the clustering of dark matter evolves with redshift. Uh, we cannot do this with galaxies alone because galaxies um, have some kind of unknown factor, we call this factor bias. And so it doesn't actually, galaxies, galaxy clustering doesn't directly tell us um, uh, how strongly dark matter is clustered. 
But if we cross correlate uh, galaxies with uh, the lensing from CMB polarization, then we can actually learn the clustering of dark matter as a function of redshift. And so just to give you an example here, um, this is a large scale um, LSST or Rubin now called, um, it will measure a humongous number of galaxies. Here, it, the number of uh, density of galaxies expressed in terms of how many galaxies per square I minute mean we get. Uh, you can see it can be you know, tens of galaxies at low redshift, but even at high redshift, um, we get uh, a few galaxies per arc minute. And of course, uh, LSST will measure basically half the sky. So we're talking of billions of galaxies um, overall, each of which will have a reasonably good redshift uh, determination. So we can split these galaxies by redshift and we can cross correlate against the CMB lensing. And the right panel now is showing um, how well we can measure the clustering uh, amplitude of dark matter clustering as a function of redshift. You can see that we can get sub percent amplitude errors uh, all the way to redshift six uh, or seven. So this is interesting because first of all, um, because uh, well, it's telling us something about the dark matter, of course, because we're measuring dark matter clustering. But dark matter itself, uh, the clustering of dark matter is strongly influenced by the, by the dark energy, by the, for example, by the dark energy equation of state. And uh, th those effects can, for, can therefore tell us directly uh, what dark energy is, is um, by looking at this clustering strength as a function of redshift. Next slide. Um, what else can we measure if we know amplitude uh, of clustering as a function of redshift? Neutrino mass. That's another uh, thing that we can measure. And the reason is that neutrinos are kind of free swinging particles that fly around in the universe and they kind of, you know, they, 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 uh, they, don't, uh, they don't cluster basically on small scales. And because of that, um, even dark matter uh, clustering uh, is slowed down and slowed down very, very specifically uh, as a function of redshift. And it has a very unique prediction how much it slowed down. And this is another effect that uh, this uh, cross correlation uh, can tell us. And again, um, against uh, um, some experiments like LSD or maybe uh, Spherex, we, uh, we think we can measure the sum of neutrino masses to about maybe 20, 25 milli electron volts. Uh, the guaranteed signal is roughly uh, twice that. So we think that, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have maybe at least a, a two sigma detection of um, neutrino mass. And if the hierarchy is, of neutrinos is inverted, then actually it will be much more than that. Okay, uh, next slide. And finally, uh, that's not all. Uh, there's one more thing that we can measure with this um, um, uh, effect of combining um, um, weak lensing effect on the CMB polarization with galaxies, and that's primordial non gaussianity it turns out that, uh, again, as I said, there are many different flavors of inflationary models, and some of them predict primordial non-oceanity. And a typical number uh, to target for is uh, expressing this FNL, as we call it, and it's of order unity. Let's say that's the typical number we, we try to shoot for uh, in the future experiments. Now, there's a very interesting effect that um, um, we can exploit when we combine galaxies and, and uh, lensing. Um, for example, if FNL is zero on the bottom left panel, you can see fluctuations in the power spectrum for galaxies and for lensing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, galaxies uh, have a, an unknown offset we call bias um, relative to the dark matter. And that's why galaxy, the blue line is above the, the lensing line. But one thing that is interesting is that uh, we can combine galaxies uh, at different redshifts in a very specific way. We can give them different weights as a function of redshift so that they basically trace the dark matter uh, nearly perfectly. It turns out that we can get this cross relation coefficient uh, to about 95%, as shown on the upper right panel. And what it is saying is that they're tracing the same fluctuations, galaxies and lensing. They, so there's just a constant offset between the two. That's uh, the bottom left panel. It's uh, basically saying that if you take the ratio of galaxies to the lensing, you'll get something which is completely constant. Okay, that's true if there is no primordial non gaussianity So if FNL is zero, on the other hand, if FNL is one, what happens is um, this primordial anxiety does not affect the dark matter clustering. So lensing is still the same. On the other hand, galaxies get clustered more at low L. So that's the uh, FNL equal one panel there. You see the galaxies at very low L, the clustering goes up. And again, you can take the ratio of these two things uh, and the signal will be very clean because all of these cosmic variance fluctuations will cancel out. Okay, so the bottom right is now showing the predictions uh, from CMBS stage four experiments uh, together with um, uh, LSST. 
And you can see we can reach this FNL uh, um, errors to a fraction of one. Uh, and that is telling us that we, uh, with this method, we will be entering regime of very interesting uh, tests of, of various inflationary models using their predictions for Bernoulli and Oceanity. Okay, next slide. All right, so in conclusion, um, I hope we convinced you that we have come a long way since the original theoretical ideas, very speculative theoretical ideas of this ENB or curl and free and curl free decomposition of CMB were for, for first proposed and first formalized in 1996. Uh, one can say that the job of us uh, theorists was uh, almost done. It's not quite true because we lensing effects and stuff like that were still needed to be worked out, but certainly in terms of this basic structure of this decomposition, uh, our job was almost done, and but the job of experiences, experimentalists just started. And since then, there have been probably dozens of experiments. We already listed some, uh, and but the best and largest and also the most expensive are still to come. Um, we already have some very interesting constraints uh, from mean boats on, opti on optical depth, from B modes on gravity waves and uh, lensing, and but the future uh, constraints will be a lot better. Uh, and they will get also uh, better if when they will be combined, when the lensing effect uh, will be combined with large scale structure in terms of these cross correlations. So uh, basically me measuring CMB polarization is a gift that keeps on giving to cosmology. It has given us already a lot of excitement for 25 years uh, past, and it will give us even more into the future. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, we. Don't, uh, we're not trying to argue that B modes are the answer for everything. And so before you ask, no, we cannot measure the Hubble constant with B modes. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Many thanks to our lecturer laureates. Uh, why don't I ask all three of you to be on screen? And our discussion moderators are both advisors to the prize. Jean Luc Pouget is the principal investigator for the Planck High Frequency Instrument. And incoming advisor, Licia Verde, is an ACREA professor, Instituto de Ciencias del Cosmos, Universidad de Barcelona. So uh, congratulations again to the three awardee. And I also uh, forward to you congratulations coming from the participant, uh, more than 260 right now. And thank you for uh, uh, this uh, uh, six hand, uh, very interesting and wonderful uh, talks. Uh, so let me start uh, uh, with, the, there are very uh, interesting and very nice question and I'll have to select. So let me start uh, with, uh, with a question. Um, can you comment on what could be possibly the next uh, frontier of CMB science uh, uh, spectral distortions? I'll take Any that of you. what else does. Spectral distortions. Um, I think it's very interesting. It's going to be uh, difficult. Um, I think the most um, interesting possibility with spectral distortions is to, um, first of all, detect the mu distortions from small scale structure and also to then map that mu distortion as a function of position on the sky to test. Um, various models for non-Gaussianity, primordial non-Gaussianity. Uh, I think it's interesting though, because all of the measurements that we have with the cosmic microwave background and galaxy surveys probe roughly three decades in distance scale, whereas inflation actually predicts that the primordial perturbation should be scale invariant over like 15 to 22 decades in distance scale. And um, it's conceivable that with spectral distortions, we might be able to get um, another two or three orders of magnitude in there. Thank you. Jean-Luc. Okay, uh, so uh, congratulations also uh, from, uh, for the uh, presentation and, 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 and the talk. Uh, there is a, a question, in fact, uh, uh, coming from uh, Michael Turner, which says, uh, if you detect the B modes associated with inflation, what is the next step towards testing, making more firm the case for inflation? And uh, you, 
you don't expect the B modes to be associated with inflation. What is the next step for testing inflation? I, I can say something. Um, so one avenue is the um, if the B modes are are sufficiently strong that one can also detect the the slope of the power spectrum of the of the tensor modes. Then there are certain predictions that one can one can uh, try to see if they if they agree with the data about the about the slope of the tensor modes. And then of the other the other avenue is to study in more detail the other fossil that we have from this epoch, which are the density fluctuations. And um, in, in that respect, Urs already mentioned uh, uh, the study of non-Gaussianity, which is a given that the density fluctuations are also something that you know remains unchanged uh, as the universe evolves when they are outside the horizon. We can learn about the process that produce these density fluctuations from studying their Gaussianity. And uh, once you once you do that, uh, th that is a rich signal that you can see, you know, the endpoint functions of various orders. Also, they depend uh, on um, the configuration of the points. Say you take a three point function, it depends on the configuration of the three points on the on the sky. Um, and so there potentially is uh, it's a lot of information there, but I think most important to say is that there's no guarantee that we will get enough information to figure it out, or at least in a in our in our in our own uh, lifetime. So we are it, it's just an exploration, right? So we're trying to see if all these fossils contain enough information, but uh, it's it, at some level it's a it's a it's a hope. Thank you. Uh, let me pick another question from this uh, excellent uh, list uh, from Reno. If you had to choose between a search for B modes and deviation from the Planckian shape of the CMB, which one would you bet on now? If uh, one of you three is a betting person, maybe you want to take this one. So the question is, what would I Bet on first detection of spectral distortions or detection of B modes. I'm going to go with B modes. <laughs> I think the the issue is that we have experiments that are going after these B modes. Um, we've got CMB S4. We've got Simon's Observatory on the way. We've got um, subsequent you know current generations of Acton SPT. We've got Keck Bicep. We've got Class. Um, light bird on the horizon um, and spectral distortions. We just don't have as much momentum experimentally. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, another question, uh, in fact, from uh, Subir Sarkar, which is for Euros. Uh, how would you remove the possible galactic B modes foreground due to magnetized dust, which has a black body like uh, spectrum? Uh, so, uh, so and uh, this seems to 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 limit the sensitivity to R to better than point one. So what what would you say? I, I would defer to you, Jean Loup. Can you answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> that was a question I had prepared for. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, you don't want to answer it. No, I have, to, I have to say something. Um, well, okay, so suppose there is some, some foreground that actually is a black body so that we cannot use frequency information, then we still have non-Gaussianity information, right? The distribution of these foregrounds is not Gaussian, and so we can still do a lot in that direction. Now, how much, I don't know. I don't know if we can go down to 10 minus 3, but certainly uh, there are things that can remove the foregrounds uh, statistically that do not involve uh, frequency dependence. Thank you. Uh, let me try to uh, combine together two different questions so we, we, I can answer as much as possible. One from Carlo Bacciagalupi and one from Robert Cadwell. So can you foresee uh, ways to detect chirality in B modes and can fluctuation from non-standard processing during inflation also, unlike a Gaussian fluctuation, give some B modes, and uh, can we learn something from that? 
or observe them or learn something from that. I can take that one. So there are models for inflation in which the inflaton is coupled to a turn Simon's term in the gravity from gravity, R R dual. And in those models, it is possible to produce um, a disparity between the abundance of right-handed circularly polarized gravitational waves and left-handed circularly polarized gravitational waves. Now, if that happens, um, it's conceivable that you could detect that parity breaking in the EB cross correlation and the TB cross correlation in the cosmic microwave background. Um, I looked at the prospects for doing this in a paper with Vera Gluscevich and Robert Caldwell, I think, um, a while back. And we concluded that um, it was going to be difficult unless the chirality was maximal unless you have like all right circularly polarized or all left circularly polarized. Um, but there've been some papers since then um, where people have done a similar analysis and come to more optimistic conclusions. So I think it's possible, but um, it's gonna have to be a fairly large amplitude chirality. And I can say a few more words. Also, just to, it, it looks like this uh, question was planted because uh, Rom <laughs> also asked the question. And said, oh, good job, Mike. I didn't know we were allowed to do this. Um, <laughs> so, no, the, the only other comment I would make uh, is that, uh, okay, we've already made this discovery that the tensor modes are subdominant to the um, density fluctuations and okay if we think in the context of inflationary models this is maybe not surprising but it's still a statement we can make about the extremely early universe uh, which you know it's an interesting statement just a general statement we can make we've already discovered so i think uh, um in that context uh, it's 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 interesting to think about more crazy ideas and even you know just a statement that is kind of model independent and interesting in my opinion <clears throat> there is a question from uh, Carlos Frank. Uh, is there a degeneracy between measurement of the dark energy and neutrino mass from cross-correlating CMB lensing with galaxies? And what the accuracy you quoted uh, for, for measurement of the neutrino mass assumed for dark energy and eventually other parameters? Yes, so um, the degeneracy is, uh, is a lot less than one, uh, would, one would naively expect. So dark energy we know kicks in at very low redshift, you know, below redshift two or one, and that's when it starts affecting the growth of structure. Uh, whereas neutrinos are have a more, you know, slower effect. Uh, basically, they they slow down the growth of dark matter by some constant fraction for each e-fold of expansion. So it's it's a it's a very different um, uh, type of slowing down uh, of dark matter uh, growth. And that's why they can be separated quite well, uh, neutrino mass and, and dark energy. Thank you. So uh, I know that uh, you concluded by saying uh, that, uh, you know, the job of the theorist is done and the job of the experimentalist is just started. But uh, uh, there are limitations of uh, what can be extracted, of the information that can be extracted from the CMB. So here's the question from Megadonawe, but uh, who resonate with uh, also other questions. Uh, so there may be a limit uh, due to our lack of precision on the astrophysics, example, foregrounds that, you know, put a ceiling on what we can tease out from the CMB signal. Mm, do you want to comment on that? Any of you three? Yeah, yes. Um, all right. So the foregrounds, obviously, that certainly are uh, limiting. Um, and as we as we already discussed, right, especially the foregrounds have the same uh, frequency dependence, then they're really um, difficult to remove. Uh, but there's a related uh, question that somebody was asking about just astrophysical uncertainty in terms of galaxy clustering, right, and especially these, in terms of these cross correlations. And it's true, uh, certainly on small scales, uh, those uncertainties do do come in. Uh, but uh, just for example, this primordial long uncertainty that, that I was showing, that's on the very large scales. Uh, and we don't think that uh, astrophysical uncertainties have anything to do with that specific effect. So it depends on what kind of question we're trying to answer, right? Uh, some, some of these, uh, uh, on some of these things, we really can make a lot of progress as we keep <laughs> repeating 
the noise, in other words, as we're keeping, you know, increasing the sensitivity, we can just keep getting better and better results. On other things, we certainly will be limited by both, uh, by basically unknown astrophysics, both on the biasing side and on the foreground side. Yes, uh, just uh, to uh, <clears throat> related question from uh, Nabila Ghanim. In fact, galactic surveys may be limited by our ability to model nonlinear evolution uh, of structures. And so do you see a theoretical limit to what we could ex extract from the CMB science for? Yeah, well, this is basically what I just talked. I don't know, maybe Matthias wants to uh, add something more. Oh, I think it's true that uh, we will, in the near future, we will be certainly be limited by, by these kind of questions. And in many parts of uh, other parts of cosmology, we are hitting systematic uh, um, systematic effects uh, limiting us. But also one can stay, take a step back and look at in the longer uh, time scale, a lot of these things might uh, might resolve themselves through other measurements of other things uh, or more powerful uh, um, theoretical methods. I think uh, just the history of the field, looking at where we are now compared where we were in 1996, I think one should never bet that we will not be able to go around uh, various problems that as we as we encounter them. Hopefully, this will continue into the future. Thank you. Uh, let me proceed with the million dollar question uh, from Mike Turner. If uh, somebody detects the MIMO associated with inflation, what is uh, the next step toward testing the case of inflation? And if you don't detect the BMO associated with inflation, what is the next step <laughs> for testing inflation? I think Matthias answered this part of this question already. Um, if we do detect BMOs, we can try to measure their rectangular power spectrum. And there are predictions that various inflationary models make for that, the slope of that power spectrum. Um, there's the non-Gaussianity, which I think is interesting. Um, if you don't detect the B-modes, then uh, I don't really know. Um, you know, different theorists have different takes on this. Um, my opinion is that if within 10, if we have not detected B-modes within 10 years, um, then there is something wrong with the textbook description of inflation that we currently have. Um, whether it rules out inflation or not, I don't know. It uh, <clears throat> depends on how you precisely define inflation um, and how you precisely define rule out. Um, but I would say that if we don't detect B modes within the next decade, um, the things that we tell our students in classes, um, you know, and that we write in our textbooks are going to need to be changed. Can we quote you on that? Yes. <laughs> I just uh, I expand myself uh, uh, about the separation of, uh, of the B modes uh, from the dust uh, component, uh, which I've been working on too for, for quite a while. Uh, the distribution on the sky is very non Gaussian, of course. And uh, so that gives us a powerful tool to, uh, uh, to separate probably the, the cosmological part from 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 the galactic part and the correlation with other tracers. So what, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, we that was exactly the answer I gave earlier, uh, right? Um, so yes, indeed, the non gaussianity of the distribution of the of the dust and other programs is very different from the CMB. And, uh, and that will be a powerful tool. Uh, to be used um, in combination with the frequency dependence. Also, even, even now, the, the, there is quite a, a bit of interest in what we are learning about the ISM from these measurements, the ratio between the E and B power spectrum from the dust uh, and ways to make predictions about the orientation of uh, the polarization from other tracers. So I think uh, as we learn more also about the physics of uh, dust and its alignment and so on, we might uh, get uh, other other ways of uh, attacking this problem that might help uh, eventually for the cosmologists clean it and also for understanding what's going on, which is interesting in its own right. Thank you.
Now, a question that uh, theorists like you may love or hate, we'll see, from Deepak Munshi. Uh, we know that artificial intelligence and machine learning made, uh, you know, uh, a big entrance in, in general in, in, in astronomy and astrophysics. What role artificial intelligence and machine learning, you think, uh, are going to play in CMB research? Right, maybe I should answer this. Um, so yeah, yeah, machine learning is definitely very powerful and one should never discount it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if there is one place where we do not need it is CMB because it's linear and we know exactly how to write down the likelihood and we can do the analysis without ever ne having any need of machine learning. So if there's one place where we do not need it, it's CMB. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Francesco Piacentini uh, is asking, uh, in fact, uh, the possibility about uh, the possibility to measure the primordial gravitational waves uh, with causal waves observatory such as LISA. So. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that LISA is not going to have quite the sensitivity to get to an inflationary gravitational wave signal, but there are discussions of a subsequent um or larger scale space-based gravitational wave observatory like desigo or big bang observer um, which right now are just uh you know white papers and uh, studies uh, but those could conceivably have the sensitivity to start probing inflationary models so that's an interesting question uh, thank you uh, we may have uh, a question for uh, uh, one last quick answer uh, question. So let me uh, ask a question from Amol Raina that says whether uh, the CMB B modes or whatever imprint on the CMB B modes can uh, tell us something about dark matter models. Um. I can but their different gamma matter model can have measurable imprints on what we see as the B mode power spectrum. Yeah, the answer is yes. And um, so, you know, the canonical model for dark matter is some substance that interacts with everything else only, including itself, only gravitationally. Um, but just about every model for dark matter that any particle theorist has ever come up with. Um, has at some level some interaction with ordinary matter. And when we do these calculations of the cosmic microwave background power spectra, um, we are assuming that the dark matter interacts only gravitationally, but it's easy enough to add a switch into the calculations uh, to take into account the possibility of a small coupling between dark matter and baryons. And this has actually been a fairly um, significant effort over the past um, decade, and especially over the past five years. And um, the cosmic microwave background, the, the remarkable agreement between the standard cosmological model and the measurements has allowed us to place very, very tight constraints on a variety of different um, types of couplings of dark matter particles with ordinary matter. So we're doing it. All. We're already doing that. Thank you. I believe uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Sorry for all the other wonderful questions that are uh, that are out there. Thank you to Drs. Pujay and Verde for a wonderful moderated discussion. Uh, please do stay on screen with us as I have the pleasure of introducing a few closing speakers that we've invited to end these proceedings on a slightly more personal note. Uh, first, let me invite Michael Turner, the Senior Strategic Advisor at the Kavli Foundation and the Rauner Distingu Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus at the University of Chicago to say a few words about Mark Kamienkowski. Professor Turner. Hey, thank you, Sarah. Uh, first of all, uh, Mark Urosh and Matthias, congratulations on this well-deserved Gruber Prize and your very significant contribution to cosmology. Um, I can say that rarely does a single theoretical insight have so much impact and so quickly. 
Within a few years of your papers, the quest for the B modes of the cosmic microwave background polarization was the new holy grail of cosmology, one which attracted the most talented experimentalists, including two previous Gruber Prize winners, and almost $1 billion from governments and foundations around the world. And all this for good reason, because as you have told us, the detection of the BMO polarization signature of inflation produced gravitational waves is a key test of inflation. Its detection would instantly reveal the scale of inflation, and it would become the earliest probe of the universe by more than 20 orders of um, magnitude. In my memory, only the asymptotic freedom papers of Pollitzer, Gross, and Wilczek rival the impact of a single theoretical insight. Um, they shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2004, which doesn't quite have the luster of a Gruber Prize, but there is no Gruber Prize in Physics. And finally, um, Mark is one of the two best graduate students I've ever had. Um, I have to say that because uh, many of my other graduate students may be listening. Um, and uh, I almost didn't have him as a student. Uh, he came to me at a time when I was very busy. I can't remember why I was very busy. So I gave him a really hard problem that he shouldn't have been able to do. And I thought he would go away and never come back. Um, well, he did come back and very quickly and he solved that problem. Um, he uh, finished his PhD work in three years, uh, went on to prestigious fellowships and faculty positions at Columbia, Caltech, and Johns Hopkins, all with tenure. Um, and um, Mark, in addition to being a fantastic person and uh, a good father, has the rare combination of great technical ability and good taste. And good taste is something that we, we talk about a lot. And I just want to give my definition uh, here, the ability to pick problems that are really important. And this one was, and ripe for an important new insight. And uh, this one was, his, I, I don't have time to discuss his, his uh, manifold accomplishments that have advanced cosmology and, and make him a leader of the field, but I think, uh, this prize reflects that. And so, Mark, I'm really proud of you, and I wish we were all together so that I could toast you in person and come give you a big hug. Thank you very much. Those are very kind words. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Let me now present Lyman Page, James S. McDonald, Distinguished University Professor in Physics at Princeton University, to say a few words about Urosh Selyak. Professor Page? Hi, thank you. Uh, again, let me uh, just add my congratulations uh, for to all three of you, and just uh, it's a delight just to be able to say a few words about Urush. I think I first became aware of him through his 1993 paper with uh, Ed Birchinger on the maximum likelihood approach to finding the amplitude of the fluctuations in the Kobe data. Uh, a couple of years later, Ken Gang and I uh, did a related calculation. And that was about as close in time as I ever did anything to, to, uh, to what Urosh was working on. And he was a second year graduate student. And since then, I've just tried to stay aware of what he's up to just because it's, it's always so interesting and it will always likely be what others are working on in a few years, just uh, incredible insights into neat problems and, and approaches to them. So you've, all, you've heard about the accomplishments with those of Matthias and, and Mark, and I just wanted to tell you some things about Urosh uh, maybe you, that you didn't know. Uh, one is that he's a fabulous mentor. Uh, he seems to do it through some combination of being demanding, yet also generous and communicative. And I just watched him when he was at Princeton. Uh, his graduate students included Rachel Mandelbaum, Kevin Huffenberger, Chris Harada, and Nikhil Padmanavan. And they all got hooked on cosmology and they are all still contributing to the forefront of the field. And I'm sure there were many after uh, Princeton that I uh, didn't know about. Uh, he's upfront and generous with his colleagues as well. Uh, he once chided me for being on a paper where the referencing to previous work fell short. He just said, Lyman, your name is on that paper. <laughs> uh, and not long after that, he helped me work out the statistics for a paper on the CMB photosphere. And then on a different front, when we were trying to uh, pitch ACT, 
to the NSF where Michael Turner was at the time. Uh, we just showed, uh, showed plots that he made and we showed them for many years. Now, and he's, he's not only generous intellectually, but he's far-sighted and generous financially. Uh, you've probably all heard about the Chime experiments, great success with, with discovering FRBs, and we hope eventually uh, charting the BAO to high redshift. As far as I know, it's uh, Jeff Peterson who had the insight to do 21 centimeter intensity mapping. And Jeff wanted to build a cylindrical parabolic receiver prototype at CMU to make the measurement. And like Eros found funding for him to help do that and, and to, con to contribute to that prototype. Then Mark Halpern got interested and with colleagues, including Jeff, Chime was born. So for all the things everyone hears about and for the many, many more ways you have advanced our fields, uh, a hearty congratulations. And again, congratulations to, to Mark and, and, and Matthias as well. Thanks. Iman, thank you so much for this. Uh, Lyman is one of my favorite physicists, not only because he's a great physicist, but also because uh, we both have a passion for sailing. And, uh, but Lyman is much more <laughs> passion than I am, <laughs> but we both have sailboats. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Page. And last but never least, let me present Richard Bond, University Professor at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. Say a few words about Matias Aldariaga. Professor Bond? Well, greetings, everybody. Uh, first, a uh, huge congratulations to all three winners, who I count as uh, good friends as well as brilliant co-thinkers on our collective cosmic quest. Uh, broad and deep, very, all three, and fun. So many feasts amid the science with the three all over the world, all over our local cosmic web, sometimes known as the earth. Uh, with Matthias, been on a sabbatical fairly recently at the Institute for Advanced Study, saw firsthand what he has forged and he has definitely forged a greater center out of the great IAS center, attracting uh, many of the best and brightest young cosmic minds that will define our future. And through the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research at Canadian ski centers and other uh, enjoyable locations, uh, I am proud to have attracted him to play with us. He is now on the executive committee of the Gravitation Extreme Universe program, helping Canada to uh, further define its cosmic future. And last but not least, through something really quite fun, a Simons Foundation program on modern inflation cosmology, a wonderful grouping of talented young led by Eva Silverstein of Stanford, I am happy for me to be declared a modern rather than an ancient inflationist. Uh, we meet New York at the Institute under uh, the auspices of uh, Matthias Stanford and what is really great, fun idea testing Zoom adventures throughout the pandemic. So there's been this ongoing close interaction of everybody. So Eva and I chatted about what I should say about our good friend, a proud Argentinian. Think of Zaldariega and Maldacena, both at IAS, amazing country. I emphasize to Eva, bold. Eva emphasized, curiously enough, conservative. To be bold, well, how can you be anything else if you're an early universe researcher? But conservative, uh, looking, and he is, looking with sharp focus and some skepticism of his own ideas and everybody else's ideas of our hope for observability of primordial gravity waves, uh, the B mode and all that that we've heard so much about here, and non Gaussianity of the collective field that gave rise to us all including our local co cosmic web uh, location, the Earth. To Matthias, it is modern inflation that we do and decidedly not postmodern, if you understand what that means in terms of what you wanna believe or do not wanna believe. Uh, 
now I must emphasize speed, not just to remind me to speed up, but Matthias and Euros for their fast codes, for in body, and most famously for the blindingly quick CMB fast, whose offspring codes have been the workhorses of all CMB and most LSS experimental cosmic parameter analyses. And the code is run by high school students. So this is CMB spectra for the masses enabled by Matthias and Euros. Uh, I shall end on this cosmic get together should not end without remembering the world's master particle and cosmology calculator, Steve Weinberg. Steve Weinberg. Some of Matthias' most effective work in the past decade has been to apply Weinberg's effective field theory ideas to the early universe and large scale structure, e.g. to non-Gaussianity. Thanks to him and his many collaborators that he has engaged with him on that journey, it is now almost industrial in scope, in a good sense. So now we dub him as Effective Matthias, and that's a good title for him. <laughs> congratulations, Matthias, and congratulations to all three. And the sad point here is that I can't raise a glass in person with you, but I have no doubt that the future will have us raising many glasses together. Cheers. Thank you very much, Dick, for those uh, very kind words. It's it's great that, that that you were able to to say some words about me. You, you're of course a, a real hero and mentor for me for many years, and somebody that I've looked uh, up to for for a very long time. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bond. And our very final words go to our co-founder and president emeritus, <laughs> Patricia Gruber. Pat. I'm a happy ceremonial footnote to today. I'd like to add my happy congratulations to Mark Kamienkowski, Uros Seljak, and Matthias Zaldariaga. As you're aware, your peers on our committee have selected the three of you with deliberation, with rigor, and with enthusiasm. You've been chosen as most impressive from a very impressive field. As you've heard, your excuse me, your colleagues have praised your work with admiration. We join you, we join them with appreciation for your work. It's been 21 years since my late husband and I partnered our foundation with the IAU. It was a transformative moment, both for the foundation and for this prize. It's been 10 years since we established the foundation at Yale where these prizes will continue. Our belief back in 2000 that recognizing cosmology and the remarkable research and discoveries in the field would make the world a better place today has been recognized today because the work that you have given us is science worthy of the highest recognition. So warmest good wishes to all of you and congratulations again. Thank you, Mrs. Gruber. Congratulations again to our three recipients and thank you to all of our participants and to our audience. Thank you for joining us today. This adjourns the 2021 Gruber Cosmology Prize.